us Christians are willing to stand up for our beliefs and our values and that we stop being frightened of confrontation. Because one thing that I have observed about the Liberal Progressive is if you stand up to them strongly enough, they will bend. If we use the narrative of the oppressed minority, we speak their language back to them. And by exposing their hypocrisy and the inconsistency of their practice, we begin to win the argument culturally. We don't need to be saying to society, you can't marry homosexuals. Let them. What we need to be saying is, we will never tolerate you forcing us yeah. to marry homosexuals. Because if we Christians are not learning about our doctrines, if we're not learning about our values, and if we're not learning about our history, how can we possibly imbibe them and express them? Thank you very much. So, I want to talk about the things that fellowships need to have. The church, and again, I'm going to number them, so if there's one you want to ask a question on, or there's one you want to discuss, you don't need to remember the point, you just need to remember the number. And then when you remember the number, I'll reread it, okay? And I want to talk about what every fellowships, what all the fellowships need to have. Now when I say fellowship, I'm essentially saying the church in its entirety. The church at a local level, the church at a national level, the church at a city level, the church at an international level. And I'm going to number a couple of things, 15 things very quickly, that churches need to have. Because at the moment, the way that fellowships are structured right across the Anglosphere, particularly, is not relevant to what the church needs to have. You'll see what I mean as I go forward. So the church needs to have, every fellowship needs to have, at the parish level, so just to break down that vocabulary, that's at the local level, that's the church you go to, parish level. And also at the diocesan level, and by diocesan I mean an area, an area, so a group of collections in a geographic area. So every church needs to have at the parish level and at the diocesan level, permanent or semi-permanent evangelists because there are too many fellowships not doing evangelism. And if we don't take evangelism seriously, how do we expect people to become Christian? I'm someone who does evangelism. There's lots of people out there curious. There's lots of people out there hungry, but there aren't enough people speaking to them. And there aren't enough people drawing them in because there aren't enough Christians who take this seriously. Now I recognize that if you're a Christian at Speaker's Corner, this probably doesn't apply to you. But there are too many fellowships that are not doing evangelism at all. They need to have either a permanent or a semi-permanent evangelist. Christians at a parish level or at a diocesan level need to have libraries and study rooms. Because if we Christians are not learning about our doctrines, if we're not learning about our values, and if we're not learning about our history, how can we possibly imbibe them and express them? So studying the faith has to be supported at a parish and diocesan level. That was number two. Number three. The church needs to establish a welfare system at a diocesan and national level, which covers things like mental health, care for the elderly, employment support for the unemployed, which is networked to Christian employers and managers, that has family counselling, that supports ex-offenders, that supports a school system and has hospitals. And the reason for that is because our education system has been taken over by liberal progressives who are pushing an ideology we cannot support. Hospitals are increasingly moving in a direction that will force Christians to carry out abortion, euthanasia. Families are breaking down. Ex-offenders, they just need support, full stop. Um, um, and also mental health, because there are peak Christians who become Christians who have mental health problems, and we need to deal with that and not ignore it. I bet you any one of you in your fellowships can identify someone who has a mental health issue. Just remember the numbers, guys. Num number four. Every fellowship at a diocesan and national level need to have an active commitment to creating families. There are simply too many single Christians in the Anglosphere. And the reason for that is because the church has abandoned the idea of the creation of families to 
the Hollywood model, the romantic model that came out of Hollywood. The idea that you see someone across a smoky room and then you fall in love with one another. That does work in some cases, but it is blatantly a massive flop in the Western world. And that is why we have a crisis of demographics. It doesn't work. We need to commit ourselves to the idea of arranged marriages and organize ourselves appropriately at a diocesan and national level. Number six. Christians need to teach apologetics and polemics in every parish and in every diocese because Christians need to know how to defend their faith and they also need to know how to criticise the faith of others. That was number six. Number seven, Christians need in their parish, diocesan and national life a rhythm of Christian life that addresses the spiritual, economic, political and social concerns of the Christian community, without which too much of our life ends up being taken over by the secular way of doing things. We need to be closer and live life on life with one another in those spheres. Question, thesis number eight. Christians need, at a parish and diocesan level, to do vocational training. The idea of vocation is central to the Christian life. Now, finding your vocation is a guided meditation. And too many churches do not teach this guided meditation. And so many Christians never find their vocation. And it should be particularly targeted at young men and women between the ages of 18 and 24. Number nine, Christians at the parish and diocesan level need real structures of discipleship. The idea of having your spiritual father, your spiritual mother, someone who is teaching you and educating you in the faith. Number 10, Christians need at a diocesan and national level a body that God's orthodoxy, the Church of England particularly as one example, is a church whose bishops have been taken over by heterodox non-Christians who believe that following the culture is akin to following Christianity. And so they go along with cultural ideas of modernity rather than standing upon orthodoxy. Please just remember the number and then you can ask a question at the end. That was for you, number 10. Number 11, Christians need to organize at a diocesan and national level, business networks of Christians, so that we can move Christians into jobs and so that Christian businesses can support one another. Yeah. Number 12, Christians at a diocesan, national and international level need structures that can guarantee their security. Because we have seen at every single level of society and abroad that no one is defending the Christians. Nisar Hussein was told to move out of Bradford by the police. They did not protect him when Muslims were harassing and trying to kill him. No one came to the help of the Christians of Syria and Iraq. They stopped um, ISIS not to defend Christians. No one has helped the Christians of northern Nigeria. No one has helped the Christians of the Central African Republic. Just as a caveat, I support the idea that those structures have to work within the law. Point number 13. There needs to be a body established in every nation state that defends and represents Christians legally because we are seeing increasingly that the secular liberal state is intolerant to Christians and is not willing to guarantee the rights of Christians and we know that in Muslim societies particularly Christians do not have equal rights with Muslims. Point number 14 Christians need to establish in every nation state political parties to represent themselves politically to the rulers. Finally, number 15 is just advice on the last 14. Don't duplicate something that already exists, support good ideas that already exist. Therefore, to use an example, we don't need in this country another body to represent us legally. We just need to support those Christian organisations that do, and there are such organisations. We need to make sure that within any institution or organisation we establish, that we are recruiting Christians to maintain its Christian identity. Furthermore, it is better to do less better than it is to do more badly. 
and it is always better to recognise what you can do as an individual and what you need to do with others in a group and what you need to do with other groups and other fellowships. And you've got to recognise each problem as being something I can tackle or something that I and others can tackle or something that others and others together can tackle. And you've got to build, break down the problem into those spheres. So, any questions? Yes. Uh, I think it was point three, maybe four. Yeah. You mentioned far left, or just left wing indoctrination of children. What, what would be your plans to curb the power of left wing? So, in terms of, in terms of curbing the power of the left wing, as in so far as it affects the Christian faith, it has to emerge from the fact that we as Christians are willing to stand up for our beliefs and our values and that we stop being frightened of confrontation. Because one thing that I have observed about the liberal progressive is if you stand up to them strongly enough, they will bend. They will back down, they will stand back, they will give you space. So the more we stand in solidarity with one another, and the more we stand up for one another, the more space we will gain for ourselves. We should structure the argument based upon the narrative of being a religious minority. Because the liberal progressive left works from an ideology called intersection, based upon intersectionalism. And it's the ideology of power structures that lead to oppression. If we use the narrative of the oppressed minority, we speak their language back to them. We expose their hypocrisy. And by exposing their hypocrisy and the inconsistency of their practice, we begin to win the argument culturally. Perfect. And that's the kind of thing we need to be doing. We don't need to be saying to society, you can't marry homosexuals. Let them. What we need to be saying is, we will never tolerate you forcing us yeah. to marry homosexuals. Right. If they want to kill their babies in abortion, it's tragic. We can't stop them. But let us defend every Christian doctor and pharmacist who doesn't want to give out the pill or carry out an abortion. Yeah. If they want to work on a Sunday and tear up the social fabric by never giving workers a common day off in which to enjoy one another's company and re-establish the networks of human solidarity, let them. But let us defend the right of every Christian never to work on a Sabbath so that every Christian family and every Christian can stand together. That is the kind of fight that we need. Because if you win inch by inch, centimetre by centimetre, ground for your own existence, eventually the, 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 the society that is oppressing you begins to topple. And if you don't believe me, look at how the liberal progressives are destroying what they call the homogeny and the patriarchy. They started by winning rights based upon exceptions, and now they are winning the idea that those rights that were once based upon exceptions should now be obligations to all. So that in Canada they recently tried to pass a law saying that you had to describe someone by whatever pronoun they wanted to be described themselves. <laughs> That's how it works. We've seen that it works. There's nothing to stop Christians doing the same. Yeah. Any other questions on any other points? Is, is there, um a lobby group within government for Christians? There are Christians within government, but the problem with Christians in government is that they have accepted the restrictions of liberal modernity. Is there a group of them pushing... There's loads of Christians. There's loads of Christians within politics. Listen to me, bro. Christians who are involved in the Conservative Party are not able to stand up for the things that I'm talking about because they have accepted what modernity teaches, that Christianity is restricted just to doing charity work, that that's our sphere of influence that we're allowed, that we can't influence foreign policy from a Christian point of view, or that we can't influence health policy from a Christian point of view, or we can't influence the prison policy from a Christian point of view. We Christians need to slowly but surely infest and take over each institution that forms people and forms the law and forms the application of the law. That is how you begin the process of re-Christianization. It happened, it worked against us, it can work for us. Any other questions on any other points? Thank you, Rob. That's it. That's it, I think. Okay guys, I'm gonna take a break. Nice one, Bob. I'll be Thank back you. and we'll do some more in a bit.
Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Bob. I mean, the thing is, hopefully, videos have solutions. The, well, I, I think I offered a solution. It. Like, basically, Erdogan's got a fall. But they tried that two years ago with a coup. That's because no one backed them. Do you know who who protected Erdogan? It was America, I suspect. What are you talking about? It was America that attacked him with Petro Erdogan. So, so who? who sorry, Pet, Petro, Petro, a yeah. guy Petro. So who who supported them? The Kurds. The Kurds that being persecuted, as you said on video. Did you know that? No, I didn't. Well, I didn't I, know that. Erdogan is related to me. Okay. His nephew is married to my auntie. He's, he's got to go, bro. He, listen, you don't know what's going on in Turkey. Really, you don't. There's a lot of things that you, no one knows what's going on. So do you agree with me, the conversion of the Sanctuary Church into a mosque? I've been, I've been there. I've been there. It's but beautiful. It's right. they, yeah, but do you agree turning yeah, it into a mosque? What I'm saying is there's no solution. It's going there to get solution. worse. It's going to get worse. What, what attack you Turkey? Turkey? How are you? you are he doesn't now. give a shit. Everyone yeah. don't, don't give a shit. Kid yourself. I'm saying this that. I follow, a, I follow a logical face. No, no country is going to make sense. No country is going to touch it. I follow a face. love you. We love you too. Have a lovely day. How are you, bro? I'm good. So, well, let me ask you something, Bob. So, do you be I'm actually on a break, problem. but go on. So, do you believe... Because well, I'm Quran only. I don't know if you're part of Quran only. Yeah, I know about Quran only. Yeah, because obviously I've rejected it. So, so, obviously... Are you a Muslim, yeah? Do you, let me ask you something then. Do you agree that Sahih... Do you agree that Hadith is second source of law? Uh, not all of them. Majority, I mean, neglect Hadith. But, but do you know Sahih Bukhari compiled over 600, like 600 pages, right? He rejected 592 out of that. He rejected 99% and he he, he think 1%. Okay. But, uh, but listen, but brother, if he lived on 10 years longer, he would have rejected another 99%. Bob, Bob, he would have made doing? a Quran only. Just walking away from me. <laughs> Bob can't take the trip. Bob don't like it, man. Nah, good to see you though, man. Any, yeah. any message to everyone that's been wondering where you were, what, what, what you've been doing, what you've been up to? I've just been at home, man, chilling out, avoiding this place. I just. I was cycling through, so I thought, let me come in and see who's here, man. <laughs> you know, boring, so I thought, yeah, yeah. Let's, let's come and see what's going on, any good debates. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been there a couple of hours. Oh, cool, cool, so cool. It's cool, been alright, it's been, I, I'm, like, I'm not used to this speaker's corner where there's no beef, there's no drama, <laughs> but I like it though. <laughs> well, there's I like no it. time, we're, we're, obviously, since Tang gone, I mean, now you Tang you're, gone, Raj is not here, no Modine, it's boring. <laughs> it's boring, we need the action in this it part, really man. Oh, it's good, good to have you back though, my lord. Big up to Soko, man. Big up, buddy. God bless you, bro, yeah?